Iranian nuclear scientist Mohsen Fakhrizadeh has been assassinated. Tehran accuses Israel of the killing and says it will retaliate at the proper time. Meanwhile, the International Atomic Energy Agency has warned against a military strike on Iran. So, who is responsible for the assassination? What is the motivation? And how will it affect regional security in the Middle East? To discuss these issues and more, I'm pleased to be joined today by Joseph Gregory Mahoney, Professor of Politics at East China Normal University, Fouad Izadi, Associate Professor of American Studies at the University of Tehran, and David Minashri, Professor Emeritus from Tel Aviv University. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Wang Mengmang. So, a well-guarded, prominent nuclear scientist killed in broad daylight. Um, Tehran acknowledges he's a martyr, but has been trying to downplay his importance. And for Western observers, however, um, he was seen as instrumental to Iran's nuclear programs, perhaps so important that in 2018, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu asked the world to remember his name. So, uh, let me ask you this, Professor Izadi, just... What do we know about Fakhrizadeh, and what does his death mean to Iran? Well, uh, as you mentioned, he was a very significant uh, scientist, not only in the, in the field of uh, nuclear physics, but uh, because of his job. He was a deputy minister, and he was engaged in other scientific projects. Uh, for example, in the last number of months, he was working on uh, combating coronavirus. So he was, uh, as, a, as a manager of uh, different uh, uh, national projects, he did much more than uh, help Iran uh, secure a place in its uh, quest for a peaceful nuclear program. He did uh, engage in other activities as well. Uh, and his significance, uh, I think you also mentioned, that uh, we had uh, the prime minister of the Zionist regime, um, talking about him uh, specifically, he, uh, Netanyahu has mentioned one Iranian scientist by name, and that is uh, Dr. Fakhrizadeh. So he, his loss is quite significant uh, for people. People are mourning uh, his uh, uh, martyrdom, assassination, uh, and uh, I think uh, the uh, request mm -hmm. for uh, response uh, is a national request uh, all over Iran. Yeah, and Professor Mahoney, how readily do you think that Tehran can find another talented scientist to take his place? You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert on, on their uh, scientific core. Uh, uh, I'm sure that they have uh, lots of people. Uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, they've known for a long time that he was a target. Um, I'm sure that, uh, that they have other people who can step in and, and take his place, uh, but I'm not really uh, qualified to discuss uh, um, who they have to replace. Yeah, well, the Iranian government points its finger to the Mossad, but Tel Aviv hasn't confirmed or denied the allegation. Uh, Professor Izadi, um, are there reasons to believe that Israel is responsible for the killing? I think the general conclusion in Tehran is that uh, the uh, occupiers of Palestine, the Zionist entity, uh, is responsible. They have uh, uh, killed uh, four uh, other uh, Iranian scientists in the past. Uh, so he is the fifth one, and this is uh, not, nothing new. Um, and uh, um, the, um, uh, you know, th this type of operations generally are uh, also known to the Americans. In uh, cases we have had uh, news that uh, they engaged in joint operations. So when Iran looks at uh, this uh, latest terror attack, uh, they also see uh, American approval or maybe uh, a joint project with the Americans. And uh, so this is the basic <coughs> uh, argument that uh, exists, that uh, with the fear that uh, Biden administration may engage Iran diplomatically. The argument that is uh, coming uh, out of occupied Palestine is that uh, you don't have to give Iran concessions in order to 
slow Iran's nuclear program. You can assassinate scientists, you can blow up uh, factories, and that is a second option that uh, uh, people in occupied Palestine talk about, that you can engage in this type of sabotage and terror activities, uh, and if you do that, then you can uh, slow down or uh, stop Iran's nuclear program, so you don't have to talk to Iranians, you don't have to engage them diplomatically. Mm. Well, Israel is being accused of being responsible for this assassination. And Professor Menashe, if that's the case, how much did its closest ally, Washington, know about this operation in advance? Well, I, I can tell you, I, I, I don't know uh, who has uh, done this action, but it's clearly all the eyes are to Israel and the United States in one way or another. And I think that this uh, situation should be taken in context of what was going on for a long time now, since the, the nuclear deal, the JCPOA, uh, President Trump's withdrawal from the deal, and the sanctions imposed on Iran, and the, the, the rivalry and the accusations and the uh, unnecessary uh, uh, attempts to sabotage each other, it's going on for a long time. Mm -hmm. I must admit I was not against the JCPOA at that time, but uh, we, are, we are where we are. During the last year, which was a very bad year for Iran, uh, not only for Iran, but also for Iran, beginning with the assassination of General Soleimani, the commander of the Quds Force, other attacks on Iran, and uh, uh, recently this uh, uh, attack against uh, uh, Fakhrizadeh. Uh, it's, it's really is endangering the situation in the region. And I don't want to go now into the blame game, who started, who has done this and that. During the last year, with all the tensions between the United States and Iran, Iran and the United States tried to lower tempers. They were waiting, I believe, to the results of the elections, with the hope that if Biden is elected, uh, there will be a new chapter opened in the relations and actually yeah. continuing the dialogue with Iran. And the Trump also wants the dialogue with Iran. Now, I think that whoever is responsible for this action put a serious dilemma to the leaders of all countries. I, I, with all respect to the Iranians, they have a very serious dilemma today how to respond without really taking things out of control mm. and putting in fire the entire region. And they are not interested in it, I believe. And but it's also the interest of the United States yeah. to try and lower the temperatures rather than inflaming uh, uh, the fire. And Israel has its own problem with Iran. That's the, the, the problem that the government of Israel has with Iran is the nuclear program the regional policy, and for me also as an individual, uh, other other issues which has to do with domestic, domestic well, politics Professor of Iran. Well, Professor you mentioned that the stakes are high in these few weeks uh, because the Trump administration is on its way out, and Biden has said that he was willing to re-engage with, um, with the Middle East policy, especially in Iran, and Saudi Arabia and Israel know that they are losing their main allies. So, Professor Mahoney, do you think that these really explain the timing of this assassination? Was the window of opportunity closing for an operation like this? You know, I think that, uh, I think that there are several factors to consider here. The first is, um, this is the second spectacular failure uh, of security uh, on the Iranian side this year. Soleimani uh, assassinated earlier this year and now uh, this uh, gentleman uh, in this past week. Um, and, you know, I, I don't want to, to blame the victim at all, but it, it, would, it would really benefit uh, global peace and security 
if, if they could do a better job of protecting their principles because this is, uh, this is really uh, pushing things to, to a fraught edge. Mm. Um, we know that there's a domestic situation in Iran. We know that uh, uh, this, this action is probably undermining uh, the legitimacy and the authority of the, the moderate uh, government in power. Uh, we have elections coming up. Uh, uh, the hardliners may return to power. Um, there, are, there are many people who may be uh, looking to exploit this, not only on the, on the Western side, the Israeli side, and the U.S. side, but also internal domestic politics in, in Iran. Uh, I don't know. Um, um, but uh, that said, uh, with Biden, you know, I, Biden is, is no friend of, of Iran. Uh, Biden was someone who negotiated uh, when he was in the Obama administration. They, they, they negotiated the, tre the, the treaty, uh, the, the agreement to, uh, to uh, contain uh, the nuclear development in, in uh, Iran. And he uh, made it clear that he was going to return to something like that if, if he won office. And on, you know, on the one hand, I think that, that, that was the responsible thing to say. But on the other hand, it's also the most provocative thing he could have said, mm -hmm. uh, given the close coordination that we've seen between the Trump administration, uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel, and, and, and the, the attempt to try to draw in uh, some of the other Gulf states into uh, a, a treaty with uh, uh, or a recognition of Israel. Yeah. So, well, uh, you know, would I, do I think that, do I think, go ahead. Yeah, it's likely that Biden would like to, you know, reverse some of the policies from the Trump administration, but it's also very likely that the U.S. will maintain its pressure on Iran. Well, I think the, the key issue here is, you know, it, it, Biden, in a sense, can free ride on, on Trump. If Trump uh, or, or Netanyahu at this point, if they, if they actually strike uh, 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 Iranian uh, nuclear facilities, um, Biden can wash his hands of it, and, and he can enter office uh, potentially uh, to de-escalate or to, to not take blame for it. So mm -hmm. I, I'm concerned, you know, now that Biden is receiving uh, classified briefings, um, he hasn't come out and taken a strong position on it. Uh, he isn't uh, 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 waving off the administration. Uh, and I would like to see more leadership on Biden on, on the matter at this time so that, he's, that he isn't simply going uh, to, to uh, let Trump do something. Uh, that he then potentially doesn't have to worry about once he takes power. Yeah, now in what ways do you think that um, this assassination could complicate Biden's handling of his policy on Iran when he takes office? I mean, he's left with quite a few problems to fix. Uh, Professor Minashri? Well, uh, certainly it's uh, making life more difficult for uh, President-elect uh, Biden when he enters office. And maybe this was the intention of whoever is in charge of the, is responsible for this action. But I can say two things here. From the American side, I don't think that things that have been done so far are irreversible. So I believe that when the new administration gets in, sits in, he, they can continue and go back unless things go out of control in the next six, seven weeks. Mm. From the Iranian side, I, I don't think that these kind of actions will stop Iranian determination to continue with their nuclear program. And although he was a key, uh, Mr. Fahrizadeh, a key person in this program, but uh, it was a team. It was not one man. The know-how is there. So I think that these are, for me, given that Iran will continue and the new administration will try and go back to negotiations, they have now to speak about the terms. The, what I heard from Iran is no negotiation on JCPOA, no negotiations on missiles, Mm. And uh, and they must go and remove all the sanctions before we go on to speak. That's all okay, but it's you know you cannot have preconditions. And I hope we'll get to a point. And uh, uh, I agree with Professor Mahoney about Biden. But Prof uh, uh, Biden was eight years a vice president when these negotiations went on. He is in the details. He knows everything. And he has more or less 
on the side of the president at that time. So I think that they can go on and resolve the problem. My, my concern is that something has happened in Iran, which is bad, and there will be retaliation, which is not measured. If you remember when Soleimani was assassinated, the Iranian response right. was... That's, that's the thing, the because you mentioned that um, Soleimani was killed earlier this year, and now uh, Fakhrizadeh was killed again. So if Washington and Tel Aviv keep pushing, um, pushing the buttons, will Tehran be able to be able to, you know, remain restrained on this issue? Professor Izadi. You know, uh, the problem is that if you uh, don't respond to this type of uh, terrorist attacks, if you uh, stay silent when international law is broken in this uh, very violent manner, uh, then uh, the terrorist uh, organizations um, will continue engaging in these type of activities. If there is no cost to terrorism, uh, then uh, the people who organize these terrorist activities would uh, escalate their level of terrorism against uh, their uh, victims. So there is no other option but to respond and respond in a manner that uh, next time when the Zionists in occupied Palestine or the warmongers in Washington want to engage in these type of activities, realize that they have to pay a cost. So sooner or later, uh, the Iranian government will respond uh, at the time of their choosing. Uh, as I said, there is a popular, widespread popular expectation for the Iranian government to respond. You saw what happened after the assassination of General Soleimani. Millions of Iranians came to the streets uh, to mourn his passing away. And uh, what the other side obviously is doing is creating martyrs. Uh, for Iran and they don't realize that when they engage in this type of terrorism uh, they are actually helping the Iranian government to show the people that the other side, the people who have difficulties with Iran are just a bunch of uh, terrorists, lawless terrorists. So in fact, in a way, these type of activities would enhance the standing of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Mm -hmm. And this is something that the other side has not understood. That's why they encouraged Saddam Hussein to attack Iran uh, eight years during Iran-Iraq war and the other assassinations that they have engaged in. Uh, so this is not a loss for Iran. Obviously, it's a loss for the family of the victim and the victim, but it's not a loss for Iran. And this will, uh, and Iran, th this would, you know, what happened in Iranian parliament yesterday. They passed the law to basically enhance Iran's nuclear activities tenfold from what we had before. So this gives an excuse for the Iranian government to follow the policies that uh, faced difficulties in the past. And then other countries, Europeans or others who used to argue with Iran on these manners, have no other choice but to stay silent because uh, in the face of a state terrorism, there is nothing else they can do. Hmm. Iranian President Hassan Rouhani uh, said that the country will revenge Fakhar Rizadeh's death at a proper time, but we all know that Iran is looking forward to sanctions relief and, and to rebuild its economy once the Biden administration comes into office. So what options does Iran have and what will be the proper time for revenge? You know, uh, that's a decision that people are talking about in Tehran as we speak. Uh, we saw what happened after the assassination of General Soleimani. Uh, and uh, there are basically two camps in Iran. One camp is uh, arguing for caution. They are saying that uh, the uh, response to this terrorist activity should not be taken in the next few weeks until uh, Trump is out or take right before he is out, so there is this argument. Um, and there is another camp that says that if there is no response, then this type of terrorist activities 
may continue for the next 50 years until Trump is out of the White House. So the debates in Iran on how to respond, nobody is debating the fact that Iran needs to respond to this type of activities. The timing and the manner is going to be decided uh, in the next few days or so. Yeah, let me get your thoughts on this, uh, Professor Mahoney. Former CIA Director John O'Brennan called the assassination a criminal act. Uh, so how should the assassination be seen from a legal perspective? Is it in essence in terrorism? Well, you know, earlier this year, uh, the, the Soleimani assassination, which uh, Trump took responsibility for, uh, and there later was evidence that he used it as a, as a ploy to distract lawmakers in his impeachment proceedings, uh, but that there was no clear and present danger that justified his assassination. It was ruled illegal uh, by international law. Um, and I think it will be impossible for uh, whoever, whoever is responsible for this, uh, this, this most recent assassination, it will not only are they unlikely to come forward and accept responsibility for it, even if they did, uh, they wouldn't be able to uh, present uh, evidence uh, because it would be classified if it existed uh, that it was in some way warranted. So uh, I think what we're seeing is not only uh, 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 some people in the U.S. saying it was a criminal act, but we see that being said by the EU. Uh, we see it being said uh, by, by Turkey. Uh, it's been described as a terrorist act. Um, I think most people are, are aware that this type of activity, this type of targeted assassination, uh, is despicable, and it, it's really aiming uh, to destabilize. And again, you know, this, this sort of thing has long been a problem in international affairs. You go back to World War I, it, it starts, I mean, there are many factors, but it starts with an assassination. And uh, I think people in Europe and, and others are, are concerned that, that these can be deeply destabilizing events that lead to much bigger affairs that, that none of us really want. Mm. Well, Professor Izadi, President Trump reportedly asked his senior aides about the possibility of launching a strike on Iran's primary nuclear facilities. Um, and also, we know that Trump and Netanyahu are known for their unpredictability. So, is a strike on Iran's nuclear facility possible in the final days of Trump's presidency? You know, this is the analysis that that I have, and uh, uh, there are some people who share this, that uh, the main uh, concern of uh, President Trump until the next 50 days or so is his re-election and the uh, fights that he has with regard to trying to prove that there was a, uh, uh, you know, someone stole the election from him. Uh, so attacking Iran would distract uh, from uh, from what he's trying to do, which is a stay in the White House. Uh, but there are people around him, people like Mike Pompeo, uh, other warmongers that uh, have uh, had this dream of attacking Iran for many years. And then you have the people in occupied Palestine, you have the Saudis, who also would like to fight Iran using American soldiers uh, and using American resources. So I'm sure there are going to be uh, people who are going to push for a military confrontation between uh, Iran and the United States. And I hope that uh, people in the U.S. government realize that attacking uh, Iran facilities will have a response uh, so they can start a war with Iran. But ending that war is not going to be their choice. And I think a lot of people realize that fact that you're, they're going to have a lot of American soldiers dead uh, on their hands. And that is not the legacy that uh, Trump would want to uh, leave behind. You know, he has this anti-war rhetoric. Uh, he talks about endless wars. He talks about the fact that people like uh, Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden voted for the Iraq war. He considers these wars to uh, not help the United States. He's trying to... Uh, move uh, U.S. Uh, soldiers uh, yeah. uh, out of uh, Afghanistan and yeah. Iraq. And in fact, uh, one could uh, make this argument that uh, the, the reason, one reason uh, the Zionists engaged in this terrorist attack was because there is a concern among Republicans and Democrats that they don't want U.S. troops out of uh, this region anytime soon. And with 
uh, higher tensions, they can go to Trump and argue with him that maybe right. uh, uh, moving U.S. troops out of uh, the yeah. Middle East is well, not really President good Trump idea. Has been so overall, uh, I don't uh, think we are Washington. too much worried about President Let Trump. Let me just jump in here, Professor Ixari, and ask you um, and um, ask this question to Professor Mahoney. President Trump has been intensifying Can Washington's policy in the Middle East. Uh, for example, earlier this month, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo uh, met with the Saudi Arabia Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu joined their talks. They reportedly talked about the need for Gulf unity to counter Iran's aggressive behavior in the region. Uh, does this Gulf unity really exist, Professor Mahoney? Well, just to add to this, you know, uh, reports, uh, uh, current reports indicate that Jared Kushner, uh, uh, Trump's son-in-law and special assistant, uh, ha has now traveled uh, to the Middle East, I think to Saudi Arabia, to discuss uh, uh, these, this increase in tensions. Um, you know, I think that, I think that uh, Trump uh, has certainly tried to make uh, one of his key um, uh, foreign policy legacies uh, Aside from his his aggressive position yeah. uh, against China, uh, uh, his aggressive position against uh, Iran, um, and to try to create this type of grand unity in the Gulf uh, between uh, Arab uh, countries and Israel, um, we know that we've seen Bahrain and uh, the UAE uh, uh, recognize Israel in in recent times, and this was hailed as a major uh, diplomatic victory by Trump. Um, in fact, uh, there had been tacit recognition and cooperation between these countries for many years. Saudi Arabia isn't yet ready to get on board, nor are others. And we know that there's dissent, that, there, that in the Gulf there are other countries that uh, are either in the middle or closer to the Iranian side, uh, 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 Qatar, for example, uh, among others, uh, uh, parts of Yemen. So, uh, you know, I think that uh, there isn't quite a grand unity. I don't think that uh, Saudi Arabia is ready to coordinate, for example, with Washington and Israel on a military strike. Uh, but uh, again, MBS is also an unpredictable character. Uh, he's, he's, he seems to have a, 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 that same sort of character flaw that uh, we find in Netanyahu and, and Donald yeah. Trump. Um, so uh, I think what we'll, see, we'll have to see is how Saudi Arabia handles this. Uh, Right. Professor Manashri, let me get your take on this. How do you see the future prospect for cooperation between Saudi Arabia, Israel, the, um, the UAE, and other countries in the region to form a blog to um, increase their attempt to counter Iran? Well, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, it is good news that Israel is establishing relations with uh, the Gulf states. Unfortunately, it's been down, uh, done in the background of something that's a shared enemy, which is Iran. I, I'm not very happy with it, but I think, I think that there is uh, Israeli, uh, and you know, and I'm here as a, as a scholar, and I don't want to argue with Professor Izadi, who comes from a university that I respect very much, and I spent two years doing studies at Iran University mm. just before the revolution, mm. and it's. We are not here to do propaganda. We speak about terrorists, not mentioning even the name of Israel. They're in Tehran University, they teach about Israel and call it Israel. So it is our responsibility to guide our governments to stop with this uh, animosity and find a way to, uh, to live together. Iran is a country that is Israel is indebted to. King Cyrus the Great was the first man who liberated the Jews to go back to Jerusalem and build their temple. For but in in yeah. the heart of many Israel, of course, there's a Iran lot of historical context we'd like to trace. But I'm sorry, we are running out of time. But thank you so much for your engaging discussion. We'd like to thank Professor Izadi, Professor Mahoney, and Professor Menashe. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of Dialogue. I'm Wang Mang in Beijing. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.